This technicality episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Hey guys, I'm here, let's get technical. This green garbage bin is an organic waste bin, and it's for everything from food scraps to yard trimmings. Every resident of the San Francisco Bay Area is equipped with one of these things, but then where does all that organic waste go? This is South Valley Organics, a composting plant in Gilroy, California. And here, around 40,000 tons of organic waste from residents all over the Bay Area gets turned into compost. South Valley Organics actually used to be a landfill, but about 10 years ago they covered it up, and now it turns organic waste into compost. And South Valley Organics isn't the only place that does this. Up north in Vacaville, California, Jepson Priory Organics processes over 100,000 tons of organic waste, making it one of the largest composting operations in the United States. These two composting facilities work together to power San Francisco's compost program, quite possibly one of the best citywide compost programs in the U.S. In the modern age, we're incredibly disconnected from our trash. Every night after dinner, I throw my food waste away in the garbage and don't even think twice about it. And if I were of legal age to be a betting man, I bet you do something similar too. Today, let's change that disconnectedness by taking a deep dive into the fascinating world of urban composting. To do this, I wanna answer three questions. One, why do we need citywide compost programs? Two, how do citywide compost programs work? And three, what makes San Francisco's compost program so great? Part the first. Why do we need citywide compost programs? The United States has a massive food waste problem. Around 40% of the food in the US, or about 1,500 calories per person per day, goes uneaten. That's over 87 million Big Macs worth of food calories, which is over two times as much as most other industrialized nations, and enough calories to feed the entirety of Germany, Canada, and Australia combined. Breaking food loss down into more specific categories, we raced around half of all fruits, vegetables, and seafood, a third of all grains, and one-fifth of all meat and dairy. Moreover, the amount of food we've been wasting has been increasing. Food waste today is 50% more than what it was in the 1970s. Ah, uh, but Alex, you might say. I read a study once that said that just 100 companies are responsible for over 70% of global CO2 emissions. So while it's helpful that I take the train instead of drive and use my Hydro Flask registered trademark instead of a plastic water bottle, if we really want to curb climate change, we need to have top-down action. And wouldn't it be the same for food, too? I mean, yeah, I don't finish my kale sometimes, but one, can you blame me? And two, that can't be the real cause of the problem. Them. It must be big food up to their old not green habits. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, 61% of food waste occurs in the home. So if we as consumers work to eliminate food waste, we'd make some very considerable progress in solving this problem. And solving food waste is a pretty important problem to solve. 30% of our fertilizer, 31% of our cropland, 25% of our fresh water, and 2% of our total energy goes into producing food that we don't even eat. That's inconceivable. Yeah, Princess Bride, nice. Oh my god, the graphics have a mind of their own. Food we don't eat ends up in landfills. A matter of fact, there's more food in landfills than any other thing we throw away. And there, it produces methane, a greenhouse gas that's 28 to 36 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Some modern landfills have methods of capturing methane and either destroying it or turning it into fuel, but that's certainly not the majority, because landfills accounted for over 14% of methane emissions in America in 2017, making them the third largest source of man-made methane emissions in the U.S. All in all, the amount of global food loss in 2009 alone was the cause behind 3,300 to 5,600 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And even if you didn't care about the environmental impacts, food waste is bad for your wallet. The average family of four in the U.S. spends around $1,600 a year on food that just goes in the trash. Hmm. So how can we solve this problem? Well, there's two strategies we can use. Firstly, you can mitigate your personal food waste. I'm sure at one point your parents told you to take only what you can eat, so follow that and tell others to as well. Secondly, you can try to mitigate the effects of the hopefully minimal food waste you do have through composting. What is compost? Quite simply, it's decomposed organic matter which can be used as a fertilizer. But Alex, you might be thinking, if I create a compost pile at home, it's not like it's gonna help anything. Like, I know the EPA says composting leads to higher crop yields, but it's not like I'm going around yielding crops all the time and need a compost to better the process. There's nothing I can do with a ton of compost. Well, you're right. Not everyone's a farmer, and not everyone needs compost. So for us to really harness the benefits of compost, we need to implement citywide programs to collect organic waste and turn it into compost for farmers. But is that even possible? Part the second. 
How do citywide compost programs work? There are two essential components to any successful citywide compost program, collection and processing. Collection actually begins far before any garbage truck is deployed, because the biggest hurdle to jump is simply people not knowing what can and can't be composted. People are pretty terrible at this. Compost facilities have found basically anything you can think of mixed in with organic waste, from pencils to full-on computers. Indeed, the day I visited South Valley Organics, they just got in a new shipment of organic waste, and in it was a plastic helmet and this brick. Listen, I've been working on this video for months now, and I have no clue who'd think it's a good idea to compost a brick. Perhaps unsurprisingly, food waste that comes from schools tends to be especially filled with non-food waste trash. If you yourself are curious as to what can and cannot be composted, feel free to pause the video right now and take a look at this chart. Processing is the next stage of the operation. After all of the organic waste is collected, processing starts when composting plants take out all that stuff that can't be composted. Then, the organic waste is grinded up using this industrial-sized grinder, making it the ideal size for microorganisms to do their job and start decomposing. The resulting product is placed in these massive long piles called windrows. One thing that really surprised me when I visited South Valley Organics is how hot the compost gets. A matter of fact, you could sometimes even see steam coming up from the windrows, and that's because their ideal operating temperature can get between 140 and 149 degrees Fahrenheit, or 60 and 65 degrees Celsius. Why is that? Well, 80 to 90 percent of all the microorganisms found in those compost piles are bacteria, and those bacteria can be divided into two different groups, aerobic and anaerobic. Anaerobic bacteria, or bacteria which do not require oxygen, are low-key kind of useless and give compost any of the bad smells you might associate with it, but aerobic bacteria, or bacteria which require oxygen levels of at least 5 percent, are the highest IQ because they can consume basically anything but love turning nitrogen into protein and carbon into energy, and this process generates a lot of heat. However, if the temperature of the compost pile ever gets hotter than 160 degrees Fahrenheit, it can hurt the aerobic bacteria and thus the productivity of the decomposition. So compost piles must be turned and exposed to air in order to cool them down. Bonus points, doing that exposes the pile to oxygen, which as we all know, aerobic bacteria need to operate. And temperature isn't the only condition that needs to be ideal. We also got to make sure the pile has enough water so that it's moist but not sopping wet, and the ratio of carbon to nitrogen in the pile is somewhere between 25 to 1 and 30 to 1. Whoa! In learning about why compost gets so hot, we also learned about how compost works. Hmm, it's almost like I planned that. Wow, cool, sweet, radical, amazing, awesome. After between a couple weeks and a couple months, the compost is done and ready to sell back to farmers in the area. Whew, okay, so those are some pretty thick logistics, but do they actually work everywhere? Eh. New York City rolled out its curbside composting program in 2017. It's currently voluntary, and the advertising around the program is minimal, so they don't have anywhere close to 100% participation. There's certainly the potential for the program to be profitable, but it only made $58,000 in 2017, compared to the well over $15 million cost of the program itself. There are currently no plans to expand the program. Hmm. But wait, check out this article. San Francisco sends less trash to the landfill than any other major U.S. city. And it's in part because the compost program in San Francisco is thriving. So we know it can be done, but how? Part the third, what makes San Francisco's compost program so great? This 27-page document is the San Francisco Mandatory Recycling and Composting Ordinance. It was passed back in 2009, and it requires all San Franciscans to sort their garbage into recyclables, organic waste, and classic trash. This was completely unprecedented at the time because it was America's first mandatory composting law. Is this what makes San Francisco's compost program so great? Eh, yes and no. Yes, because this is incredibly important, but no, because that saying that this ordinance alone is responsible for SF's composting success doesn't take into account the nuance of trash collection in the city. There are two reasons San Francisco's compost program is so great. The first reason is their exclusive partnership with the waste management company Recology. While places like New York City have hundreds of companies competing to collect waste from residents and businesses, San Francisco only works with Recology, decreasing administrative friction, which in turn means it's a lot easier to try new things. Indeed, in the past, San Francisco and Recology have ran many pilot programs, which are small-scale tests of larger projects done to see if those projects would be successful. And many of these pilot programs turned out really well. For example, in 1996, the curbside collection of food scraps was pilot tested, and it went so well that it was rolled out to the entire city in 2001. Additionally, the genius of San Francisco's whole waste management system is that it's structured so that Recology has strong financial incentive to divert waste from landfills. Recology has a lot of stake in various recycling and composting facilities around the Bay Area, but they 
they don't have any stake in landfills. So it's to their benefit to move as much waste as possible to recycling and composting plants. Okay, so what's the second reason San Francisco's compost program is so great? Well, quite simply, the government wants it. Composting has the full support of the San Franciscan government. It all started in 1989 with actually the state government. The California Assembly passed the Integrated Waste Management Act, which set the goal of a diversion rate of 25% by 1995 and 50% by 2000. A diversion rate is the measure of how much trash you're diverting from landfills by recycling or composting that trash instead. At the time, San Francisco's diversion rate was 10%, meaning that it was sending 90% of its trash to landfills. Over the next decade, San Francisco invested cash money into making their waste management system as environmentally friendly as possible, and by 2000 they hit their goal of a diversion rate of 50%. But San Francisco said we can do even better, and in 2002 SF's Board of Supervisors passed the Zero Waste Goal, requiring San Francisco to have a diversion rate of 75% by 2010 and 100% by 2020. That's right, San Francisco wants to send no trash to landfills, and they're like kind of doing it. Thanks to all of these legislations, in 2007 the city reached a diversion rate of 72%, while California, like the state as a whole, was hovering at 52%. But San Francisco realized that without people sorting recyclables, compost, and trash in their homes, they wouldn't be able to stay on target and reach their goal of zero waste. And that's where this comes in, the 2009 Mandatory Recycling and Composting Ordinance. We've come full circle. Thanks to this thing, in 2018, the city hit a diversion rate of 80%. That means over 1.5 million tons of garbage are diverted from landfills every year. That's insane. So no, San Francisco doesn't send no waste to landfills, but they've gotten pretty darn close, at least closer than any other major US city. And that means they're doing something right. What's the future for compost in San Francisco? Well, if everyone were to fully abide by this law and separate their trash, San Francisco would be able to achieve a diversion rate of 90%. So the city is continuing to work towards that and find ways to get that last 10%. Luckily, the future looks bright, because the residents are on their side. Before this law was enacted, the city surveyed a bunch of apartment owners and found that 85% of them really liked the program. And like, when was the last time that many people agreed on anything political? Obviously, there is a lot we need to do to fight climate change, and even that's an understatement. But one factor we need to look at is what we do with our food and what we do with our waste. And compost is the brilliant solution to both of those things. Heck, the fact that you've made it this far in a video about composting shows that you care about this, and this is a solution worth fighting fighting for. So now that you know why we need citywide compost programs, how they work, and why San Francisco's is so great, you can advocate for them where you live and in the conversations you have. And in doing so, will make the world just a little bit greener. You know, this past year, I've become even more interested in fighting climate change, because it really is an issue of international security. And it's not the only security threat that's unique to the modern age. For instance, between weak passwords and data breaches, there are tons of ways our online security can be compromised. That's where the password manager Dashlane comes in. I downloaded Dashlane back in 2018 because I needed a password manager that works on both Google Chrome on my laptop and the apps on my iPhone. Dashlane works across devices and platforms, so it was perfect. When I first downloaded Dashlane, I saw that I used the same exact password on 401 different online accounts. That's almost laughably bad, because if a hacker gets a hold of any one of those, they've got access to everything. Luckily, Dashlane has a feature which can log into websites and change insecure passwords for you so they're no longer a security threat. And that's not the only amazing feature Dashlane has. Between a built-in VPN, auto-filling long forms, and dark web monitoring, Dashlane not only saves you time, but also keeps you safe. Here's the best part. Dashlane is free. So go to dashlane.com slash technicality and download Dashlane today. Plus, if you want to upgrade to the premium plan, which allows you to sync across devices and get access to a bunch of other cool features, you can use the code technicality for 10% off. Woo, this video is finally done. I've never spent this much time making a video. I didn't time track it or anything, but I'm guessing I spent between 60 and 70 hours on this. I am incredibly happy with how it turned out, and I hope you are too. Uh, and if you are, it's super helpful to share this video with someone or click the like button or support me on Patreon. Big thanks to my Patreon supporters, especially those on screen right now. They really help make content like this possible. And if you too wanna invest in not just technicality, but also me as a person, please check out patreon.com slash technicality. Thank you. We just hit 50,000 subscribers, which is mind-blowing and incredible. Thank you. My next video will probably be a 50k subs Q&A, so if you have any questions for me, leave them in the comments below. Seriously, thank you so much for watching DFTBA and Explore On.